So Juan Munez, thank you so much for letting us come into your studio. No, thank our you guys. Studio thank today. you guys for coming here. The Claire Fine Art is happy to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about how you started off as an artist? Um, I mean, I was always that kid that was drawing just on the on desk, on sketchbooks, all that stuff. And um, eventually, like I, you know, I got introduced, you know, to Disney, you know, and seeing the animation uh, like of Disney World and just Saturday morning, like when uh, when Walt Disney would have those specials, and mm -hmm. uh, it was like these black and white specials. And I was still living in Mexico; I didn't even understand them. But it, you know, he talk about the stories about them, and they would show the, the process of animating. And I'm like, ah, man, I would love to be an animator. And actually living in Mexico, I was watching Saturday morning cartoons because I was so close to San Diego that I, we get the feed from like um, just all the Saturday morning cartoon shows and I learned to speak English watching American cartoons. Wow. So by the time I moved to the United States when I was in third grade with my family, like I spoke fluent English. Mm -hmm. uh, and just animations in that story in general just always pushed me to wanting to be an artist. I didn't know what kind of artist I wanted to be. At first, I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to work for Disney just like everybody else. Yes. And eventually, it was, um, it kind of just led me into going to school to become an animator. After that, and after I graduated, I moved back to Vegas, and I didn't want to work a regular job, so I kind of got introduced into the tattoo world. Mm -hmm. Around that same time, growing up in like in Southern California, I was also introduced into the graffiti world. So it was all these like elements that I just I fell in love with. Um, and as a kid, I was telling myself that I'm like, one day I'd love to have a gallery show with these paintings and a nice, beautiful, fancy gallery, but the paintings will be all like cartoon stuff. Oh, like, I never thought that that would actually right. become a thing. Like, I thought art was, you know, it was like, it was Manet, it was Rembrandt, you know. The most it was, you know, when you saw like Warhol and like Basquiat and Keith Haring, that was the closest to what I like fell in love with. And getting older and becoming more of a gallery artist and started doing more of those gallery shows, that's when I started getting introduced to the, like, the street art, pop art of it. And I realized that you didn't have to just be one type of artist, you didn't have to just be an animator or an illustrator, but you could branch out in many, many different options. And that's when I realized I can make a career out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, it was one of the hardest things that I've ever done, but honestly, like going 15 years into just doing this full time, being a parent, having two daughters, but taking that leap and doing what you love to do, I couldn't imagine going back to like a regular like nine to five now. Was there something in those early years when you were watching those Disney cartoons and you were saturating yourself in that culture that was, do you think the desire came from inside of you or it's something that was just lit a fire by watching this on the screen? I think it was just, that tiny little spark was always inside of me mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. being, you know, such a such a kid that spent time alone. Like I had siblings, but I was the youngest in my family, and we had a tragedy very very young where my little brother passed away at stillbirth, and um, it, it left me alone in my own home, and I didn't really have nobody to play with. But I realized that watching these cartoons and watching these movies, um, all I wanted to do was to create. And when I found out what animation was, like the actual moving picture of the same cartoons that I was drawing. Uh -huh. I just focused on like, the things that normal kids just didn't really do. Like, pe like kids would draw, but I'd go to museums uh, with school and like on all these field trips, and I'm star staring at these amazing paintings by the masters, uh -huh. and I'm like, I'm, I'm just so like enthused over like, how is it made? You yes. know, I'm looking yeah. you know, at a, like an 18th century painting, and I'm just like, why is this painting so realistic? Like, right. why does it look like I could touch it? And while all the kids are running around the museum, I'm literally staring there. Yeah, I'm just staring. Like, I'm, I'm getting as close as I can to this painting. Sometimes I'm like two inches away. And I still do that to this day. Like, I go to these museum exhibits and I'll be part of these group shows. And every now and then I'll run into a painting where I'm just like, I have no idea how they did it. To me, it's like an amazing magic trick. Like, I'm a magician as well, but I don't know how to do that trick. So I'll, not yet. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. And it, and it was, um, you know, it, and it was just studying. Yes. Uh, when I was when I was younger, it was studying the line weight and studying studying why animation looks American animation looks different than you know traditional Japanese anime. And I started getting just so obsessed with it at a very very young age. And it was questions that most kids don't have at that age. So I realized yes. that yep. that spark was there. But when I started researching different forms of art. Mm -hmm. um, it just made that flame so much bigger. And it just made me want to learn every aspect of it, not just 
you know, like drawing these cartoons because I have a daughter, she's 13, and just like a lot of 13 year old kids, they're, they all have a tendency of drawing like anime and manga and like what kind of like the stuff they see and everybody kind of draws the same thing. And I remember at that age, I was just so like obsessed with it's like, okay, like real life studies and like actual like portraiture, but then trying to combine everything that I liked yes. into one yeah. thing. Little did I know that eventually when I got, like, in my 30s, that that would become what art, like, in the art world, like, has been showing with artists like Cause, you know, and, you know, artists like Banksy, that you could have this sense of humor, and art became more of just, like, the physical aspect, but the message and the story behind it, or what it took to create it. Yes. Yeah, and, like, yep. that's, to me, was, like, oh, God, like, this is amazing, like, I don't have to be the most technically skilled artist in the world but it's sharing the story and the messages yes in a very direct way where people understand it and accept it to me i was like that's what being an artist at least for myself that's what it meant like that's the kind of artist i want to be right so it seems that you almost developed your own language yeah. over those years and then you came to vegas and then how was it coming to vegas as an artist it, it was that? weird because in california like just growing up in Southern california and being around like gangs and being part of gangs mm -hmm. uh i was i didn't have a choice but to be part of a gang in, mm -hmm. in, in the place that i lived at but in within the gang it was like okay you're gonna do this, you're kind of known for this, and with me it was like, you're the one that's gonna paint on the walls. So I was oh. like, I was already drawing <laughs> everything, so I was like, okay, like, oh, he could draw, so he could do this. So, so you were the artist. I, I was the director. artist in the, in the group, and it was like, you know, so I'm, I'm tagging walls, I'm tagging, but like doing just every little vandal thing that I could. Mm. Um, and it, it taught me something of like, to draw, how to draw fast, how to have a, a concept and an idea, and like, getting it done as quickly as possible because we got to get out of there. Mm -hmm. And But that was in a world that was, even though I wanted to be involved with art and this is what I was doing as an artist, like it also was a thing that kept me out of trouble while being in trouble at the same time. Right. Um, right. But as things started getting more serious as I started losing friends to, to getting arrested or being mm -hmm. killed and my family decided uh, we need to move to, to Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly because the, the market was a lot better out here for mm -hmm. housing. The fresh so, start. Yeah, and, Leaving San Diego with that mentality of like, I'm creating art for my neighborhood, it was just that, you know, those few blocks that I lived in. Like, I never thought that I could have a career in it. Right. You know, moving to, you know, to Las Vegas and being now around where like, in my school in San Diego was, you know, 98% minorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only people that were white were the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, moving to Vegas where there was actually sports and there was actually like, integration between all cultures yes i was like oh, i'm not just limited by this yes. because when you live in the in, in the ghetto you live in the neighborhood it's like it's very rare to have an idea to get out of it right. you know and it's like you can't you can't like become a famous artist or you can't become like you could either be a musician or an athlete mm -hmm. um moving to vegas actually allowed me to be like okay i could actually probably do this for a living it wasn't until my senior year it, I was always the kid drawing in class, but it wasn't until my senior year where I finally took my first art class. And wow. my my teacher was like, was telling me, mm -hmm. "You need to create a portfolio. You need to yeah. you need to start looking into art schools." And I'm like, "I college to me it was just weird, and art school was just like a fantasy. It wasn't real." And I ended up getting accepted on my junior year uh, to a, a school in, in Arizona mm -hmm. that was actually owned by DreamWorks Animation. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't go because we didn't have the money. And then I applied again the year after, my senior year, and I got accepted. And even the day that I was packing up to leave, uh, my family was like, you know, they actually held it against me. It's like, you're leaving your family. You know, coming from a, from a Mexican culture, it was really hard for them to be like, actually get up and leave to another state to go to school. I see. Um, but coming back, being involved in the arts community in Las Vegas was yes. probably one of the best things that could ever happen to me. Do you, you feel know? that it really helped you? It helps su support and nurture your talent? It does, because when I started doing shows in Las Vegas, I started doing the little festivals like every month here in Las Vegas, and, and they were great, and they were fun, and that's when I realized, oh, like I could sell art, and then I started getting into like little smaller galleries and then bigger galleries, and what I realized during that time was I was learning to not only create the art for the shows, but also how to talk about my art talking to collectors or people that visit mm -hmm. the gallery and, well, you know, learning, yeah, it's like yeah. learning how to, like, 
sell your art and yes, yourself yes. because that's how I was gonna like make money. Yes. And what always I always felt like, you know, having a regular nine to five, you know, being married at the time and having two daughters, like mm. it's it's a crazy leap to take. Yes. Uh, but I didn't have a choice because I felt like I'm holding my own self back from this and mm-hmm. it's it's the fear of having to provide for your family. But mm-hmm. In any other city, I think I would have been too scared or just like too much competition to do that. If I would have gone to LA or New York, right. I would have felt lost. In <clears throat> Vegas, uh, even though there's always been an art community here, if you put a little bit extra effort and you keep pushing forward and you start seeing it as you know, as your career, as your life, as your business, you're able to like reach certain levels that you wouldn't reach in other cities just because there's right. so much other like things that will block you in cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, yes. and New York. Yes. In Vegas, it was like, like, there's not that many people doing it in that scale. Um, I might as well just take that torch and run with it. Yes, it seems as well in Vegas that there is a very big approach yeah. in your art as well. It has a very large universal theme. It seems to me that, is that something that's always been endemic to you as a person? I think you what think it big? was, yeah, I think what it was is that I started creating a, a specific, like the, the bunny character, Felipe. Mm-hmm. And it was based on the idea that like an older artist um, kind of just gave me a tip. It was like, try to do it, you know, try to do a show with one character and make it personal. Mm-hmm. I created the show and I was like, it's it's too personal, but I, I really dig deep and to the issues and my fears that I was dealing with at the time. And I ended up doing this entire show and the show sold out the first night. And I didn't quite get it. I thought it was just a fluke. Mm-hmm. And then I went to LA and I did a show out there mm-hmm. and it sold out like mm-hmm. preview night and it took a while to really dial it in because a lot of people were like well how is it that you're able to talk about a message that means so deep but it's it yes. is such a simple way and I'm like and it's it goes back to to me being like a kid that just wanted to create cartoons mm-hmm. it was I always felt that the, the child wonderment and like that mentality that we all have, mm. we tend to lose it as we get older yes. with life in general. You know, there's that quote, but uh, like I, was, I believe it was Picasso that says, every child's born an artist, the problem is staying one after you grow up. Uh, you know, true. and I was like, <laughs> I remember telling myself, I mean, I know, like, it is one of those things where I remember exactly what I was doing where I was, and I was in fourth grade, and I told myself, it's like, no matter what you do, you mm-hmm. will grow up, you will always love cartoons, mm-hmm. you will always love animation, mm-hmm. and you will always create art. Mm-hmm. And I just remember telling myself that as a kid, and I just had no other choice. Like, my entire life, it's like, you are going to be an artist. It was never like, what am I going to do when I grow up? It was more of like, what am I going to do today, like, as an artist when I grow up? And I realized that if you create a message that comes from its purity in the core inside of you, mm-hmm. it resonates with a lot of people. It might not mean the exact same thing to them, right. but it will spark a certain something. So having that mentality and having like, my my oldest daughter who's now 13, when she was very young, she was kind of my gauge. Like I would show her an illustration or a drawing and if she reacted to it, like emotionally or just happy or smile or whatever, right. I knew that it was gonna be a good piece because wow. the kid understood it. Right. It's when a child understands it and they accept it and they like it or they mm-hmm. have any form of reaction, whether they feel bad for the character or happy for the character, mm-hmm. that to me is 100% proof that it's gonna have an even stronger emotion with an adult. So you've been very transparent about your battles or your dealings with mental health and depression. Can you speak to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I've always, I think a lot of us just have these struggles that we grew up with, whether it be one trauma or another, and we don't even realize that we do it, whether it's the raise, the way that we were raised or just because of the situation. And yes. I realized that I was living, you know, my entire life a certain way, and I was always depressed, and I was always uh, scared, and I always felt like I didn't deserve anything. You know, I. It took a long time to realize where it stemmed from. But during that, what I call like those dark times, which was like the first 36 years of my life, um, you kind of feel like you're a certain way. and You kind of think that you're a certain way. And that's how I felt. Like I felt like I wasn't good, a good person. And I, I came to the conclusion that I was like, I, I actually was like last year, after the last four years of my life has been mm-hmm. really like, extremely up and down Mm -hmm. and the last year alone I was like I I wanna 
I see people that are happy. I see people that are genuinely like good hearted people, yes. whether it be celebrities that I admired or like just people in general that I met throughout my life, like mm -hmm. teachers and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I'm like, what is it about them mm -hmm. that brings them this happiness and joy? And I had to come to the conclusion for myself that um, all the things that I believed in in my past that I was, mm -hmm. like it wasn't the man that I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I just thought very little of myself. I didn't like myself. And I decided self -love, to, yeah, self worth. I decided to make that change because I'm like, okay, look, I've been doing this for 36 years. It hasn't worked. Right. And the reason why I get so close to reaching a lot of my goals, but then they come collapsing down. Right. You know, it's because I really don't have faith or trust or love in myself. And I'm like, okay, you've tried this for 36 years. Try to change it. You know, change it. Like, just don't even try. Just do it. And mm -hmm. I started focusing on. You know being physically healthier mentally healthier and when that started when that like snowball started rolling it was like okay now i want to be completely honest with the way that i feel because mm -hmm. with my art throughout the years people will reach out and be like i really relate to this piece and like oh i really relate to that piece so well, that speaks to me and i'm like mm -hmm. okay um apparently there's something there and if i really hone on it i think that i could help people and i started being more open, not just through my art, mm -hmm. but personally with myself, and sharing my, my struggles and my fears, because I feel that a lot of people are raised to just keep things buried, yes. and they push it yeah. more and more, and by doing that, and because we feel that we have to be strong, that's what people think strength is, is burying it in, but being vulnerable and opening yourself up to criticism yes. and to the stigma, by some people while helping so many others mm -hmm. I'm like to me it's worth it okay. so I realized that I needed to, once I started changing my life and I felt great the next step was helping others right in order for me to try to get people to open up you know four percent five percent normally that they, they, they do because people don't normally open up to their friends and family I'm like I'm going to open up a hundred and ten percent and they, yeah and if they see it then they'll be like wow, it's like he's that transparent, he's that open about it, mm -hmm. I feel the same way he does, mm -hmm. or I can relate to this, then maybe they'll be like, oh, okay, maybe I'll talk to one person. Mm -hmm. And they'll open up a tiny bit. I'm like, that's all I want. Because that's just the first step to try to get help. And if I have to be this vulnerable, this open, um, in the beginning it was, it was hard because a lot of people don't, it felt like they didn't care. A lot of people just felt uncomfortable by it. But I realized unless I make myself to be this person that others can see and be like, wow, he's completely open mm -hmm. and honest about mm -hmm. what he's dealing with, maybe I could do it a little bit too. And eventually, um, that, the negativity behind it started like going away and more and more people started reaching out that normally wouldn't. I mean, strangers that they write me and they're like, look, I wanted to commit suicide. I can't tell my wife. I don't want to tell my kids. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like this, you know, but seeing this illustration or seeing this painting that you did, really made me realize that it's that it's okay that I'm not perfect, it's okay that I make mistakes. And not only make mistakes, but embracing the fact that you yes. make the mistakes. We're yes. so programmed to be like, we can't perfect. make mistakes. <laughs> so I was like, well, how, how yeah. are we gonna learn right. otherwise? It's like, everything that happens, whether it's completely tragic or it's something that's amazing, it's like, we should embrace it and accept it because that's happening in that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And that moment won't repeat itself ever again. Right, and I think it's really hopeful that you've gone through all of this stuff and you've actually managed to keep the magic alive. Is there something that you do in your own process to keep that? I started going? focusing on, um, on meditating. Mm. Uh, and it, it started with uh, me getting physically healthy, getting mentally healthy, and then I'm, I'm about to launch my brand, like officially. Mm. Like, it's been something that I've been wanting to do and it wasn't, and it didn't happen for a reason. You know, mm -hmm. it had, a, everything had to be in the right time and right. Um, I couldn't force it. And eventually everything started coming together. And I, I realized that with everything that I was doing, um, like I wanted to, to learn. You know, I didn't have time to go back to school. So I started looking for books of people that were, you know, that launch brands, that have successful companies. Mm -hmm. And I started reading books, uh, you know, by 
you know, Tony Shea actually from Zappos has a great book called Delivering Happiness, and then there's another book, um, you know, that with Russell Simmons and just a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, uh, Branson, and and then I started like reading. I started realizing that they focus on like on just meditation, and they and they would talk about it, like, oh, I read this book by Tony Robbins, and then so I'm like, okay, so then I go look at that book. So then I started seeing a correlation between all these people that they're like. They take time for self care. Right. They take time to meditate. They the money is never the end result. It is creating what you want to create, not being afraid to go against the grain and just doing what you want to do because you feel right about it. Mm-hmm. Not because oh this is what's gonna sell. It's like no, it's like even if there isn't a market for it, mm-hmm. it's better to create a market and then blow it up. And one of the, the thoughts and ideas that came from these books was like it's easier to win a race if nobody's racing against you so it's the same thing in vegas it was like there's not that many artists doing this i'm gonna go ahead and do it right and it was so easy to just run that path and i started realizing i was like okay they meditate they they really focus on feeding their body healthy things Mm. and like eating healthier Mm. and i remember when i was you know overweight like over a year ago, I was 100 pounds like heavier than what I am now. It was right. like you know, losing 100 pounds really made a difference. But I felt better. You know, I felt more energized. And then working out, like those things that we hear constantly, like, well, if yes. you eat healthy, if you drink more water, yes. if you yes. exercise, you'll feel great. The problem is when you're down in the dumps and you're feeling like that. That's the last thing you want to hear. <laughs> but once you start getting into it, it's like, it's true. It's the basic lessons that we learn. Not only with that, but the lessons that we've learned watching like Sesame Street, love and empathy and respect for each other, mm-hmm. when you start living that life, almost like a Mr. Rogers kind of life, right. you know, when you're just kind to people, not because yes. it's the right thing to do, but because we should just be kind to each other. Right. And we should have empathy for each other. And reading all these books and meditating and becoming healthier both phys- with physically with what I eat and working out, but mentally oh, as well mentally by not well. feeling right. the need to focus on just the negative things that are in the world, especially nowadays. Yeah, it's like, if you surround yourself, but you you attract the things you, you know, that you put out. And I feel that that's very true when it comes to energy. So I started implementing these like positive affirmations and these beliefs and Mm -hmm. in my life. And I wasn't going to just like half-ass it. I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. Like Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to do it. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. It's very inspiring. But doing that, And thinking positively, it started working. It, it, and it almost felt like a magic trick. Like, mm-hmm. wow, like this is actually happening. Like, mm-hmm. I feel great. I feel better. And amazing things are happening. Mm-hmm. But just, no, you know, nothing's perfect. So just when that was going on, and I'm about to launch this brand, and I'm feeling great, and I'm healthier than I've ever been, and everything looks amazing. Mm-hmm. My niece passed away earlier this oh, year so from sorry. cancer. Right. Thank you. And it was just, yeah. it, it was a hard blow. But I remember taking that time, and it, it was very easy for me to just collapse and say, mm-hmm. screw this, this doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But I took the time to mourn, and then I really focused on meditating, mm-hmm. and I took what I've learned so far, mm-hmm. and picked myself up, and kept moving forward. Wow. Because I've learned that I could either collapse and be depressed and not do anything, but she was such a young kid. She passed away at 18 that she had her whole life ahead of her. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it's almost out of respect for her. I'm like, I can't stop living. Or collapse yeah. again. Or I can't do that. Like, yeah. I, yeah. like she was such an amazing spirit that she would continue to smile even knowing that she was going to pass away soon. Mm-hmm. So I was like, if she was feeling that way, mm-hmm. why can't I continue to move forward and with a positive message to help others and when my niece passed away I remember taking everything that I've learned so far from these books and these talks and implementing in my life and just keep moving forward and it's never like things are going to always be perfect but it's accepting the trials and tribulations that you go through Mm -hmm. use the tools that you've learned along the way keep learning as much as you can implement Mm -hmm. them in your life that way you're better suited to handle these negative things that happen Mm -hmm. So it's, there's days where I feel completely depressed. There's days where I feel the fear of anxiety because at the end of the day, I don't have a regular nine to five. Right. Like 
everything that especially I do. Especially during yeah. this unpredictable time. Especially during COVID. these times. And yeah. in the beginning when, when COVID was really like has hitting hard. Yeah, has that impacted you greatly? or? It impacted me more in the sense that I, I wanted to get the message out there even more. Right. Like I wanted to be more outspoken for it because when people didn't feel that, like very early on it, a lot of people were just kind of annoyed that they were inside. They couldn't really go out. And I kind of started thinking ahead. I'm like, yeah. it's really going to affect with people in a, you know, in a mental health kind of way. Mm -hmm. Whether they've had mental health issues before mm -hmm. or they're going to have them or they're prone to them. Um, or even the people that do have them, it's just going to be like 10 times fold. It's going to get worse. And people aren't realizing it right away. But I feel that I need to start working on this now. Right. That way when it really starts hitting people there's going to be at least somebody out there, mm -hmm. you know, and that was just one aspect of it mm -hmm. because when that was in the middle of going on, then everything started happening with the police and people were getting killed and, right. you know, all the these riots, riots. And, yeah. and I'm just like, so then it, it went from me wanting to talk about mental health, which is such a strong issue mm -hmm. that we need to focus on, talk to kids about it, talk to adults about it, have adults open up, teach little kids that it's okay to, mm -hmm. you know, to not be perfect right. and give them tools to handle feelings. But now it's like, okay, there's this other aspect, which is like this whole violence and racism and this side versus that side with yeah, elections so coming up. Yeah. And I remember that day, it was just, it was too much for me to handle. Right. And I turned off the TV and I sat with my kids and we watched Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. And sitting there, I, I came to the conclusion of, wow, like these lessons, these basic human lessons that we learn as children mm -hmm. of having respect and love and empathy for each other. Mm -hmm. If they were only truly implemented today by adults, these issues wouldn't exist. Yes. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah. and then at the same time, I'm, I'm reading these books about having not only empathy for each other, but like, even if you don't agree with somebody or somebody has done something wrong to you, mm -hmm. Looking at them as the person first beyond what you think they represent because they're wearing like, you know, a red MAGA hat You automatically feel that they're not a person They are what they represent or they are what that whole like the media represents that person to be right. But if we start focusing on looking at the person and speaking to that person mm -hmm. as another human being mm -hmm. realize that we actually have more in common than yes. we think we do right. and right. so then I had the aspect of mental health, like I'm gonna be 110% transparent in hopes that people could open up a tiny bit. So I'm like, okay, now I have this other thing where I'm like, well, now I'm gonna focus on spreading kindness and empathy and love and respect so much in that far like a spectrum of it that it's gonna annoy people, but at the same time, it's gonna be like, well, well, why can't we yes. just be a little And kinder? we need it, we yeah. need it. So it's yeah. like, I'm willing to, to go that far and take it that far, because I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen mm -hmm. If it doesn't change the world, at least I know for my kids and for myself You've done your best. that I've done my best yeah. and I have a clear conscience because of, like, I know that I've tried mm -hmm. and I know that I, that I reached out the olive branch and it might surprise somebody, you right. know, somebody might, you know, that shares different beliefs than I, than I do. If I'm kind to them and respectful to them, it might trigger something inside of them to be like, well, yes. maybe I could be a little bit yes. more open, you know, for that. And again, if even if they don't feel that way, at least for myself, I know that I could walk away and be like, I tried. Yeah.